ان شاء الله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستهدي ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ام ويلكم تو ايفريبادي فور ذس ا فيري سبيشال نيو فورمات اوف ذا يوروبيان مسلم نتورك um as you know the european muslim network is one of the think tanks and uh, the uh, platforms for uh, muslims from various european countries coming together discussing issues of uh, identity and uh, it is our uh, very special honor uh, to restart the activities Uh, of European Muslim Network today was a very, very um, important theme. Um, looking into what is happening in, uh, um, in the different European countries, the growing racism, uh, the challenges that Muslims are facing in many uh, places are deeply connected to the situation uh, that Muslims are facing in the Balkan. And one of the uh, very connected issues is uh, the situation in Bosnia. And today, 25 years after Srebrenica, we are uh, looking into, um, um, well, an analysis about uh, how this uh, genocide that happened to the uh, Muslim community uh, with, within the midst of, of Europe has uh, still very, very important connections and uh, um, uh, to, to, to the rest of the, 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 the Muslim minority um, situation in, in other places in Europe. And uh, it is our pleasure uh, that we have been able to get two um, dedicated and uh, highly competent speakers in this area. We can, uh, we have uh, on the one hand, uh, Professor Haris Halilovic, who is in uh, Australia joining us. And we have uh, Ayub Kostic uh, in Belgrade, who is as well with us um, on online. And um, I believe that, uh, Now this um, event, uh, as I said, that is uh, a new initiative uh, introduced by the European Muslim Network uh, with its uh, uh, widespread within all the Western European countries and also in a good part of the Eastern European countries uh, will uh, inshallah be um, a first initiative that are Uh, others, inshallah, to follow in the coming time. Um, all of us see how the corona crisis has changed our lives. And um, EMN has had planned its annual conference in Rotterdam in March, but due to the uh, quick changes uh, that happened, um, Uh, we have been uh, forced to change all our, uh, our lives. And uh, so also a part of the uh, activities that have been usual and have been uh, done throughout the years now have to be changed. And so we are quite happy that we will start with this format now and we expect inshallah I mean, that it will have uh, some good uh, resonance and that we can continue in it uh, in a wider uh, scale, inshallah, soon. So um, I will open up the floor now to um, uh, invite, uh, I think first, uh, Ayub, you want to uh, take over and uh, introduce the uh, theme wider and um, uh, get us started, inshallah. Please. Salam alaikum, rahmatullah, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, to Ibrahim, and uh, also I'm very grateful to Professor Haris Khalilovic that he is uh, today uh, uh, with us. Uh, so all of you uh, know that our title today is, uh, or let's say that our talk, Zoom talk, is dedicated to the 
five, uh, 25 years uh, from Srebrenica and current developments in the Balkans. So this will be basically our topic today that we will discuss with uh, Professor Khalilovic. Um, and uh, because we don't have a lot of time uh, and Paul Professor Khalilovic is more than busy uh, and I'm really grateful to him because he dedicated uh, the time uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to the EMN event. So I suggest that we go straight forward to the, to the that we start with the, with the, with the talk. So the first uh, question, Professor Khalilovic, I would uh, like to ask you um, uh, is that uh, when, I, when I spoke uh, recently, last few days when I was preparing to this uh, conversation with you, uh, I spoke with many of my Bosnian Muslim friends yeah, uh, about what they, how they perceive now the question of, 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 of Srebrenica and what is going on about Srebrenica 25 years after. And one of the questions that I think that all of, the, of them, they, 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 they posed or let's say they, they said that they, are, uh, they, they shared some kind of concerns of theirs, yeah? Is that, you know, uh, they have some kind of fear or let's say some perception that uh, Srebrenica is, uh, is in danger to fade away from the, in, in the eyes of the international community and worldwide. So this is the first question really that I think that it is very important that you address in the very beginning and then when we can continue with the, with the more uh, uh, concrete topics about the Srebrenica. Um, thank you Ayub and thank you Ibrahim and I would also love to thank uh, EMN uh, for organizing this conversation. It is very important, it's timely and I probably to talk about Srebrenica today is more important than, than 10 years ago, even uh, 20 years ago, because what happened since then and what's been happening currently uh, uh, points to that. And in, in relation to Islamophobia and Srebrenica, genocide being used as a kind of ideological pillar for far right, inspiring uh, terrorists in, in least likely countries such as Norway and New Zealand to commit uh, 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 terrorist acts, atrocities against innocent people, including Muslims, at least here in New Zealand. It, it points to the kind of inspiration that Srebrenica has provided to um, some of these groups. Um, well, uh, a, a lot of memorialization efforts regarding Srebrenica have evolved spontaneously, and they really have been community run, kind of gra from grassroots, grassroots le level. And initially, uh, for the survivors, for the families uh, of the missing at the time, it was most important to find the truth. What happened to their missing relatives later, it was realized that they were killed, at, but their uh, bodies, their human remains were hidden across a broader area of Eastern Bosnia and down to Thomas Graves. So the effort then continued to uh, uncover the bodies identify their human remains and then uh, give them a, a dignified burial. Uh, in that process, uh, collective burial uh, at the Srebrenica, the Memorial Cemetery of Otocari, has dominated the narrative about Srebrenica, has dominated the media, if, if you like. And on many of these, starting in 2005, on many of these uh, collective burials, there were uh, several hundreds uh, coffins, taboots, uh, put in the ground in one day, a completely new moment. Everyone was shocked and unprepared for that kind of experience. Whole communities would be buried in a, in a day, sometimes multiple members of, of uh, the same family and so on. Uh, I, what I wanna say is that this very personal, very, very emotional and traumatic experience has been uh, paralleled with memorialization, kind of formal mem memorialization events, commemorations of Srebrenica, which attracted sometimes large uh, uh, crowds and also uh, presence of international um, representatives from uh, Bill Clinton to, to uh, uh, many other international dignitaries. So uh, Srebrenica narrative has, has been out there, but for the survivors, it really has meant many practical challenges and from identifying the relatives to uh, burying them, to struggling with uh, coping with not only their psychological trauma, but also with, with uh, existence in, in post-war Bosnia, which in many instances included uh, returning to pre-war places where they became uh, second-rate citizens 
and uh, in in that kind of that that uh, context, they had also to perform with a lot of dignity, also memorialization and, and commemorations of of uh, what happened to their community in Bosnia. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot uh, um, now, but uh, you, you, you mentioned about uh, uh, all of this, what you said, uh, but now I'm interested uh, about the fact that you are coming or let's say you are personally from Srebrenica, your uh, part of family is from Srebrenica. So uh, just uh, uh, you, the, for, for the viewers that, you, that, that they know that you escaped uh, during the 90s uh, the, from the Bosnia and that you live in uh, Australia, you are teaching now in the, uh, at the University of Melbourne. But uh, so you, uh, you are not only academically the, connected to the, to, the, to the question of Srebrenica, but you are also personally uh, connected to what everything happened in Srebrenica. So in that, uh, um, in, in, in that uh, uh, regard, I wanted to, 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 to ask you um, one very interesting question from my point of view is, can you share for the viewers also, what was the like, you know, the life in Srebrenica before everything started, before the 99th aggression on Bosnia and Herzegovina started? So in the sense, how do you remember Srebrenica and uh, uh, what was, uh, you know, what were the, 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 the the, the 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 relationship with people because this is it, that was a very multicultural city and so on and so on so can you give us just a, this brief reflection of yours uh, from the past or let's say before uh, the aggression in Bosnia started well there would be uh, different narratives about pre-war Srebrenica but none of them would be talking about Srebrenica in any other than positive ways for me you know being personally uh, from Srebrenica, having had relatives there, having uh, lived uh, a part of my life in, in uh, that part of Bosnia, of course, it's very personal and very, very subjective experience. Can't be different. But Srebrenica is a very old uh, 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 settlement, very old town in uh, that part of Europe, not only part of Bosnia. Uh, even during Roman times, it was known as very well established settlement. It you had was known as Domavia, then Argentaria, and Argentaria referring to Argentum to Silva. So it's uh, been known for, for Silva mines. It, it attracted uh, traders from across Europe, uh, miners from Germany or, or Saxony back then. Uh, so it was multicultural kind of from uh, the, it, its early beginnings. It is also home to the Franciscan order, Bosnian Franciscan order, or, 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 or uh, Bosnian Srebrenica. So, um, and all these different cultural influences, which later, of course, expanded to, to accommodate also Islam and Ottoman influences, have been in a way integrated in, in local community, in local, you know, in local way of lives without uh, uh, necessarily creating conflict. So it was a, a, that some, some dimensions of local narratives, local stories and how people lived could uh, be really a good example of how that inclusive culture was performed and lived without any conflict. Um, I had uh, relatives there. I had my family. I had a, a, my family. Had a, you know, my, my, immediate, my parents had a home there. Uh, so for me, going to Srebrenica would mean going to a place where I knew everyone, where everyone knew me not only as, as uh, a student coming back from his studies in Sarajevo, for example, or, or coming from other places later, but someone who was related to uh, other people, someone who would uh, uh, you know, know me by my father's name, by my grandfather's. So uh, I had a whole uh, uh, bunch of uh, uh, dear friends who I, went, who I knew from my early childhood, who went with me to primary school and, and then uh, later we, we uh, might have parted different ways, but we always knew about each other. So uh, just imagine living in a very ordinary small community with uh, you know, a few thousand people where everyone was interrelated in some ways, and then all that disappears. For me now, there are no Halilovics uh, 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 living in, in, in Srebrenica. The, you know, my family perished. My family in the past, with along other families, uh, uh, like Begic, for example, and, and, and so on, they're quite... Uh, 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 present in terms of their numbers, but also in terms of their, uh, their uh, kind of leadership roles, if you like, in the community. Uh, my relative, uh, my, my, uh, my father's cousin, 
uh, Kemal Halilovic, the late Kemal Halilovic, for example, was the mayor, local mayor in the 80s. Uh, I had several cousins who were uh, medical doctors in the local clinic. So uh, three of them perished in the war, two in Srebrenica and one in Sarajevo. So they were my cousins. So I had, I had my community, my people, and I would, uh, you know, there was that network that covered different, uh, different areas of social lives. And uh, uh, being respected just to be belonging to a family was also a, a kind of a social capital, what we call. Now going to Srebrenica, there's none of that, but there's a, a cemetery where the largest number of my relatives exist in one place. It's very cross-generational from my uncle uh, who was in his uh, late 60s to uh, my uh, young cousin who was 15 when he was uh, separated from his mother in Potocari and then Kel. They are uh, uh, brothers, fathers, grandsons lying next to each other. And I'm here talking about Halilovic, but of course, uh, my mother's side family is also there. My grandmother's family side, Sulemanovic, is also there. So when I go to Potocari, I I'm confronted with all these names. And it's almost like uh, seeing these people going there and looking and looking and then realizing sometimes it's shocking kind of almost like expecting to see your name there. Like that's the name that's missing there. It is, it is always a personal uh, uh, experience, also always a confrontation and then realization that you do not have these people in your life anymore, that that place uh, is kind of emotional home, but in social sense, it's not at home anymore. Even my, my the physical structure of you know, my parents' house is destroyed; doesn't exist there. So my life, Professor, Professor is Harris, if we yeah. if we look into what you have just described, uh, in addition to what has been asked by by uh, um, uh, Dr. Ayub. Um, do you see that there have been any signs or any indications in, in the time that you have described when you have been there uh, that, have, uh, that you could foresee what is to come? Because if we look into today's Western European societies, we see that we have racism, we see that we have xenophobia. Um, how Have there been any indications or signs in Srebrenica at the time when you had the living together um, that uh, you could refer to, uh, you could see, well, it was to, uh, it could be foreseen. I think we are still also, those of us who are directly affected, we are still processing and it's hard to, to, uh, to comprehend, to find any signs that this was possible to happen. Uh, it's a border, border region, so across East Serbia, and there was a natural connection with Serbia. A lot of uh, people from Srebrenica, a lot of those who, who you know, were executed in 1995 uh, had multiple connections with Serbia. They worked there. So the, the uh, Serb military run in, uh, under the commando by General Mladic killed a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 Serbian workers, if you, if you like, Serbian students. Also uh, those who were uh, uh, related by blood to Serbs and from Serbia, including my, my uh, some of members of my family. For example, one of my cousins uh, was married um, to a Serb, uh, and he was not, not the only one, I had several of them. Was, but this one was married to a Serb uh, 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 sister-in-law, to a Serb woman, and um, they worked, they met in Sarajevo, where they, in the Belgrade where they studied together, they returned together, they lived happily life. But, um, uh, he, he perished in Srebrenica. My, my uh, only uncle from other side, his um, daughter-in-law was a Serb, Nevena, from Subotica. He also was taken at Potocari, his very advanced age, and, and he perished. He, he was shot, he was killed. So it was not, not really that you could feel, you would think that this would prevent uh, violence of that sort, but what I want to stress here that this was not locally grown conflict. It was not sectarian conflict. It was not even religious conflict. It was very well planned military operation that involved schooled officers, generals, who you know spent their lives in a, in, a, in a country that was Yugoslavia as as a communist. All of them were communists, member of communist party because that's how they were officers. They, uh, at the time when I was growing up there, I would believe that they were immune to any nationalism, that they were kind of cosmopolitan individuals. However, 
1995, uh, even in 1992, it proved that uh, that uh, uh, brother, the idea of brotherhood and unity uh, in a way was completely deconstructed and destroyed in an organized way, not spontaneous. And this came on tanks, on buses, on you know uniformed soldiers. And what is also very, very hurting for people from this local area, they came from neighbor, neighboring Serbia, not from neighboring villages, from neighboring state. And what also hurts is that that state has never uh, 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 accepted responsibility, has never done anything to ease the suffering of the survivors. It in a way pretends as nothing happened or they were not involved, even though there's overwhelming evidence that they not, not only self sponsored, they also organized and executed and paid for what happened in Srebrenica. So I, I, Ibrahim, I don't think there were any signs that this was to happen. And if you were to ask me in 19, 1980s, when I was a teenager, going to high school, that there could be a war in my community, in my country, not only in Bosnia, even in Yugoslavia. I would say like, you know, this is the, the wildest and fantasy that you could imagine. Uh, sadly, it did happen and it was very, very brutal. But I have now very, very interesting a uh, question for you. You mentioned uh, your, your relatives uh, who have been killed uh, in Sarajevo, that you lost three of your relatives in Sarajevo, yeah? Am I right? You, you, you mentioned this in your, your uh, previous- Several, group. but one of them was my cousin who was a, a medical doctor there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also very interested about this, uh, let's say, uh, a dimension because we are always, and this is also, I think, very important for our viewers, to, to know uh, and to be aware of this. And this is that, you know, uh, uh, I think that, uh, of course, genocide in Srebrenica is the most brutal, let's say, manifestation of the aggression on Bosnia and Herzegovina. But what I would like you to tell us, or let's say share with us is, and this is why we decided to put the title of this event, Genocide in Bosnia, not, not only Genocide in Srebrenica, because there were uh, mass atrocities and ethnic cleansing in many other places around Bosnia. For example, in Priedor, in Gorazde, uh, we had the Sarajevo siege uh, for three years, which, is, which presents the, 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 the longest siege of, uh, of a city in modern history in Europe. Uh, and so on. Then we had the, what you mentioned uh, also just briefly, the cultural seed of destroying of the cultural heritage of Bosnian Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina from the Ottoman period, which is absolutely uh, more than valuable was, uh, and so on and so on. So um, can you give us, a, 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 let's say, a brief reflection on, on this uh, aspect? Because I think that, you know, uh, Srebrenica is somehow, uh, of course, it has to be put in front and because of the genocide and everything. But sometimes I have an impression that people worldwide or let's say the international community, they even don't know about, for example, the atrocities in Gorazde, in Priedor, or many other, you know, uh, uh, very important also uh, 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 tragedies that, that, that happened uh, during the aggression or uh, 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 during the 90s. So please, if you can give your... Uh, very, very, very good and very important point, uh, Ayub. Um, the war in Bosnia started in 1992, and um, we, uh, well, we, or people from outside, can relate to, to it through what they might have seen in the media. And in media, there was Aron Haviv in, in April 1992 in Bielina, following a, a militia from Serbia and uh, taking photographs of the atrocities there. And those pictures have become kind of emblematic of the start of the war. Similarly, we had pictures uh, about concentration camps in, in Priedor. In, yeah. in uh, July, August 1992. Again, the you know, world was shocked by through what they could see. However, many, many uh, acts of very cruel violence of whole families and communities being slaughtered uh, was not filmed. There is no uh, video or, or, or photographic evidence of that. So we don't know much about it. However, uh, what happened in Srebrenica cannot be seen outside of the context of the rest of Bosnia and Herzegovina, when we, if we only focus on, on uh, what on the on the five days of or, or, you know, days uh, between 11 J July and about 19th of July, that you know when uh, physical executions of people 
were taking place, we are going to miss the point of, the, of the, what happened in the rest of the country. Also in Srebrenica itself, in Srebrenica itself, the war started in 1992 with the town being occupied by a militia from Serbia, survivors escaping and then returning and then recapturing uh, uh, the town. And thousands and thousands of, of refugees, of the survivors running away from other villages and towns in, you know, in Eastern Bosnia, some you know, over 100 kilometers uh, uh, apart, uh, ran to that refuge. Srebrenica was the last refuge for, for survivor, surviving Bosnian Muslim Bosniaks in that part of Bosnia. There was no way to, to uh, get uh, uh, anywhere from there. But um, the Srebrenica became the UN safe area. There was a presence of United Nations soldiers there. And also when this geno genocide, the Srebrenica genocide was, you know, was happening, they were present there. So there was a media attention on, on what was happening at the time. Uh, however, just focusing on July 11th and that triumphant and mur murderous uh, 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 actions of, of General Mladic and his troops uh, would not explain what happened there, why happened there, and the, the, the whole uh, uh, ideology behind uh, that final uh, large massacre that took place there. What happened in Priedor? in 1992, in Vienna, in Zvornik, in Visegrad, in Foča, in countless other places and small villages. And I've been to some of these unknown small villages where whole village was slaughtered. Everyone was killed. So there are so much, there were so many atrocities that it is uh, correctly to call what happened in the Bosnian, the Bosnian genocide. And in fact, in the genocide studies, in, 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 and I'm part of you know, genocide studies uh, a network, uh, the, the common term is the Bosnian genocide. Uh, of course, Srebrenica is there because it was legally uh, confirmed that actions that took place in Srebrenica, the crimes that took place there, uh, constitute a genocide. It's the first uh, judicial ruling ever to be, to find a, a atrocity like that uh, to constitute a genocide. That's why this is important from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned now uh, the UN. Uh, so this was also, I had the, the, in mind this question that I asked you about this. So also the, and, and uh, for, for our viewers that you know that uh, uh, Professor Halilovic has uh, his own page on Academia Edu and you can find on Academia Edu very, very valuable papers and book chapters that he wrote. Uh, one of them is uh, about the role of United Nations and how they were incapable, show themselves absolutely incapable of protecting the, the, the Srebrenica and the fall of Srebrenica and this uh, genocide that uh, took place. So can you give us, because you, you wrote about this, so can you also give uh, some kind of more information and, and uh, clarify to the people what happened uh, uh, regarding the UN and how they failed in their mission? Uh, my, my friend and colleague Hassan Nuhanovic published a book under the UN flag, which yes. really in its title explains what happened there. It was also the first genocide that happened literally under the UN flag. The UN flag was still flying uh, above the, the uh, back, battery factory in Srebrenica and Potocari when Serb uh, troops started you know, their the, uh, uh, genocidal plan or, or, or you know, to execute it on the ground. Um, the role of, of the United Nations has been, uh, uh, as, as uh, confirmed through several reports, has been uh, a failure, the, the biggest failure of the United Nations mission. But uh, it also went just beyond the kind of abstract idea of the United Nations down to the actual uh, 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 troops present there, which were UN Dutch troops, um, as uh, recognizing uh, their responsibility, their political responsibility the, the, the Dutch government, uh, you know, the, the Dutch parliament resigned you know, as, as a sign of, of accepting that responsibility. The same uh, Hassan Uhanovic, who I mentioned, whose parents were handed over by the UN troops to the Serbs and then all perished, his mother, father and brother. Hassan Uhanovic sued uh, uh, Dutch government and won at every instance. So uh, this is confirmation of responsibility, which was not just pass, passive by, being passive by standards. They, you know, they violated the duty of care and in some instances allowed uh, and facilitated the, the, the genocide to happen. Of course, we should never uh, uh, 
uh, remove the blame from the actual perpetrators. And, and talking about the UN, we should also remind ourselves that International uh, Tribunal in The Hague is also a UN organization, ICTY. And thanks to ICTY, the facts what happened in Srebrenica and the rest of Bosnia were established. The first sentences ever in post Second World War Europe about genocide were handed over and life sentences to the masterminds of genocide as well to, to several perpetrators. So uh, UN, let's hope UN uh, would have learned from, from what happened there, but um, it is uh, beyond you know, <laughs> reasonable doubt, if you like, that the role of UN and the, the, in, in stand, the international, the, the passive stand of, by the international community and ma major players like NATO at the time uh, uh, created conditions for genocide to happen. Mm. And if we are uh, uh, then looking at the, the United Nations uh, uh, Convention of Genocide uh, Prevention and Punishment, we can see that you know, prevention, uh, no state prevented genocide to happen, but the one that was uh, found guilty of violating that uh, convention by uh, Serbia. So even though Serbia would uh, say, yeah, we were not found of committing genocide, actually that the convention states uh, 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 punishment and, and prevention. And Ser Serbia has neither punished nor uh, prevented genocide in, in Srebrenica and needs to be reminded here. Yeah, but you also now, uh, because you, you, you mentioned the legally confirmed, that uh, the importance of legally confirmed uh, uh, genocide in Srebrenica, and you also touch upon now the Hague Tribunal, but uh, 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 you also wrote a paper, which I found very interesting. One is also about the shortcomings or let's say the achievements of the Hague Tribunal. So, and also, so I'm interested, uh, uh, what do you see as a, let's say uh, mm -hmm. achievements, but also I'm interested, what do you see as the shortcomings of Hague Tribunal? And uh, if you can also uh, reflect upon a little bit, uh, because we have this trend for now years and years, uh, that Serbs, the Serbian propaganda is always talking about Hague as some kind of political uh, uh, a court that it is, it is court that is, you know, was uh, directed against Serbs and so on and so on and so on as some kind of conspiracy theories. Uh, but so I'm interested that you give us the, 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 your opinion of uh, definitely that there are huge achievements of the Hague Tribunal, uh, especially regarding the material and the, 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 the evidence and collect, the, 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 what, what is there uh, collected mm -hmm. and so on. But also, uh, uh, as I said, if you can just from your perspective, uh, 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 give your, your view about the shortcomings as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ayub. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm not a legal scholar, but you know, I do uh, uh, always insist how important ICTY is institution, you know, important role it had. However, when talking to, to uh, ordinary people, to the survivors, to people who might have returned to places of, of residence, those who directly were affected by genocide and, and war crimes in Bosnia, I see a lot of um, well, a lot of limitations in terms of the uh, impact of the of the judgments, and some are kind of the, the severe in, in the context that they uh, exist, like the uh, life sentence. There are no death penalties in Europe, and these life sentences uh, are kind of the, the ultimate punishment, if you like. Uh, but still, on the ground, um, the, you know, something that's called traditional justice in terms of how this is implemented and changing communities and communities kind of going through some catharsis and then uh, reconciling, you know, different ethnic and religious communities. So I don't think these, these uh, judgments uh, had uh, that impact. Also one of the shortcomings of the judgments that uh, they were reduced down to individual responsibility of the, of the main actors. So there was not a kind of a, a larger entity such as military or even the state uh, being found guilty and then uh, uh, to that that uh, that judgment kind of to have also that uh, uh, reparations dimensions. So not one single survivor uh, uh, won a reparation for uh, their family members being uh, killed or their property being destroyed and looted and the suffering caused to them. Uh, rather, they were uh, very often reduced down to to uh, really to the margins of society, to uh, uh, charity cases. Their homes were not. Uh, 
uh, repaired by the per perpetrator or some independent fund, but rather by charity and very often sometimes previously large monumental buildings were reduced to, to little shelters. So which in a way was an additional humiliation of the survivors. So in that regard, ICTY has not delivered uh, mm -hmm. a, a justice for the survivors in a, in a, in a tangible uh, form. Apart from this you know, feeling of, yeah, justice was done, that perpetrator is in jail and uh, kind of having moral uh, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Sadly, uh, those communities that identify with the perpetrators and see them as their heroes, uh, as I said, there was no catharsis. Uh, in many, many you know, instances until now, we have seen uh, these people treated as heroes, even after serving their sentences and you know, being freed, coming uh, to, back to Bosnia, to the part of Bosnia called Republika Srpska or to Serbia, they receive a hero status, they receive state pensions. Biljana Plavšić, former professor of biology in, in, uh, in Sarajevo, who became the, the fiercest nationalist and, and uh, 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 deputy leader of, of uh, Serbs during the, the war. Um, she received a, a very VIP treatment uh, at the time, President of Republika Srpska, Dodik sent a private you know, plane to bring her from Sweden, and then now she is in Belgrade enjoying a celebrity status. The same is with other war criminals, such as uh, Monk, uh, such as Monchilo Krajšnik, yeah. those who are still in, in, in jail, uh, Radovan uh, uh, Karadžić and Ratko Mladic, uh, also celebrated. There's a culture of triumphalism, which I... Uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to ask you. Can you, can you, because you, this is one of the most, I think, uh, uh, important concepts that you are introducing and, and talking about is a culture of triumphalism. Yeah. So, and also, which is absolutely directly connected what you are saying now uh, with the genocide denial, which is taking place uh, widely in Serbian society or in the wider region or let's say uh, where the Serbs are living in, Rep in the entity of uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Republika Srpska, uh, also in, uh, in the, in the, by Serbs living in Montenegro, uh, in Serbia as well, uh, what, what you said. So can you also uh, uh, tell us more and how you are defining the culture of, of triumphalism? What is the culture of triumphalism if you put it this in the context of 10 stages of genocide yeah. and how the culture of triumphalism, or let's say this 11th stage of genocide or, or some, some kind of, of what you said now, this uh, lack of any kind of uh, uh, self-reflection or let's say uh, some kind of catharsis in the so society in Serbia that it, it didn't happen. And then not that it didn't happen, but what you are now mentioning, and uh, this is uh, something that I want to, 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 to emphasize, it is uh, I am uh, living in Serbia, so I'm the eyewitness uh, of what is going on in Serbia, especially from 2012, uh, mm -hmm. when the, those who were the worst one mongers and, and people who were even uh, 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 are, are, were responsible for, uh, for paramilitary troops uh, and were engaged in, 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 in indirect ways or some of them we have uh, 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 indirect ways in the war in the, in the ex, on, the, on the soil of the ex Yugoslavia. Uh, they are in the in the in, in the in the power in Serbia from 2012. So we see now Alexander Vucic, Tomislav Nikolic, and all of these guys who are the 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 most vicious uh, uh, proponents of uh, Serbian uh, uh, Great Serbia uh, and Serbian nationalistic uh, uh, ideology. So um, uh, what? So can you give us also your perspective on all of this? Uh, because you really dealt with this uh, issue. Yeah. In depth. yeah. Thank you, Ayub. Thanks for reflecting on that. Um, uh, it is a quarter of a century since genocide in Srebrenica took place. It's 75 years. It's literally half of my life. Hmm. Uh, if we put into perspective, or say, uh, after the Second World War, uh, this would be, you know, the year I was born in, 1970, is it? So, uh, or... or you know, well, definitely when life was normalized in Europe, when Nazism was, you know, uh, the, 
dustbin of history. It was uh, the whole generation uh, went through a, through a catharsis, through a change. And then anti-fascism well, became kind of, uh, 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 yeah, to be polite, to be civilized, to be educated, you, you, know, you, you were anti-fascist. Sadly, what we see in, in, in the region, you know, where Bosnia is located and in Bosnia itself, is that, that those 25 years have not uh, moved the country uh, far away in terms of uh, distancing uh, people, personally distancing themselves from what happened, those who would be uh, uh, seen as representing or uh, uh, belonging to a, a group, ethnic group that perpetrated the crime, uh, performed the crime or pre uh, committed the crime in, in Srebrenica. And also those politicians that you mentioned who were, you know, literally, you know, their party was a radical, so a radical party. They were radicals. They were the kind of forefront of, of radicalism and radical politics in, 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 the, in Yugoslavia at the time are now mainstream politicians. Mm -hmm. So what was even after the war, what was regarded as extreme behavior in terms of offending, you know, uh, uh, spreading uh, hate speech, uh, offending uh, uh, other ethnic groups, uh, celebrating war criminals. All that was seen as extreme, extremist behavior after the war, but now is, has become mainstream. Just to remind our, our viewers that the current president of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, is on, on record, and you can find it on YouTube, is the only leader in Europe who, had, who said in the parliament that for one killed Serb, he will kill 100 Muslims. Mm -hmm. He has not kind of changed his rhetorics. He has just kind of made other people believe that somehow this is acceptable, that kind of uh, speech and that uh, celebration of, of, of uh, war criminals. The same president of Serbia was also the one who uh, put a, a, a staged protest and to, to name uh, uh, squares and streets uh, after Ratko Mladic, for example, in Belgrade. Uh, all this goes beyond the actual denial. There are stages of genocide. Genocide is not, does not happen out of blue. It's not a kind of a, a brawl that erupts where people you know, have a conflict suddenly. It's a very carefully planned uh, process. It starts in the, in the domain of culture, you know, with uh, stigmatization, classification, discrimination, mm. in the process of dehumanizing the other. So mm. your neighbor or the, the, your enemy. So, and then goes to different stages, including extermination, physical extermination, and then comes denial. Part of the denial is also hiding the, the, the physical evidence of crime, the bodies of the victims, dumping them in mass graves, uh, pretending nothing happened. But in, in the Republika Srpska and in Serbia, what we see is not denial anymore. It's literally triumphalism. Where the war criminals have been uh, given uh, uh, public institutions, such as uh, student dormitory, for example, named after, after Radovan Karadzic, all of them have received uh, 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 awards uh, by, given by the president of Republika Srpska. Uh, even with, in popular culture, this has become a, a trend where there are jokes about genocide being told, where the, the fans on soccer uh, matches uh, display banners with, you know, knife uh, uh, via Srebrenica, no Žica Srebrenica, has become kind of the popular culture in Serbia and Republika Srpska, even beyond that. They are uh, 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 songs with, with uh, mocking lyrics that uh, uh, are performed at, at weddings, Serb weddings and, and private parties that literally uh, uh, call for Srebrenica to be repeated three times in Srebrenica or in other places. None of this is, has been sanctioned. So there's no uh, law sanctioning genocide denial or hate speech. And we have entered 25 years after genocide happened we have entered a stage of triumphalism. We might have entered it earlier, but it is a new moment in history, a new moment in, in genocide studies, because other genocides, uh, some might have been denied, but not glorified. Mm -hmm. uh, others, others would, most others would be you know, sanctioned, and then people would go uh, through a period of, of catharsis where there would be a generational kind of progress and people would embrace uh, uh, other, other ideologies, other forms of, of other values, if you like. This uh, has happened in Rwanda. In Bosnia, we have 25-year-old 
uh, uh, men and women who were born after the war, who uh, have grown up in this climate of, of both denial and triumphalism. So in that regard, I'm pessimistic uh, what might happen in the future. I was surprised that genocide happened to my generation because I lived in a completely different environment, completely different values were promoted at schools and in neighborhoods and at home, and completely different songs were you know, uh, performed you know, for my generation compared to what uh, this generation in Serbia, Republic of Serbia especially, what they have been exposed to and what they have been accepting as a mainstream, as kind of acceptable forms of, of insulting others in uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, those who are confirmed, jailed, war criminals, where every part of the, the sentence was contested in, in a courtroom, uh, seeing them as their heroes. It's very, very, uh, mm -hmm. it hurts survivors. And to me, as both a scholar and a survivor, uh, it is also very kind of a uh, worrying trend. Yeah, I have a, a, a also now I, I would like to connect uh, in the beginning of the conversation, Brother Ibrahim mentioned something about uh, uh, did uh, you have some kind of, you know, that, that you could perceive what will happen in the beginning of the 90s before the aggression started. But I'm also in, in that regard, I have a very, very important question to you because you are also mentioning this in one of your papers about the never again slogan that the Europe used this never again slogan after the Holocaust and the Second World War. And, uh, yeah, and how the politicians and many people around the world used Srebrenica, politicized Srebrenica from their old, old political agendas and so on. And what I'm interested in is that from my perspective, this never again, and, uh, and you are saying this in your article also, became even more, let's say, hypocritical or, you know, uh, meaningless when this happened again. You know, we had, so they were saying never again, and then we had the genocide on the European soil against the Muslim uh, uh, population uh, uh, in the 90s. And then it is clearly showed uh, to us that these things can happen again. That this never again doesn't mean that it, it can't happen again. So now I'm interested, you know, uh, because regarding we are also European Muslim network and we are witnessing the, 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 the huge rise of uh, far right movements and uh, huge Islamophobia or let's say anti-Muslim racism all around Europe and uh, anti-immigrant sentiments and so on and so on. We have uh, very clear right-wing uh, powers uh, um, uh, in Poland, uh, uh, in Hungary, in Serbia we mentioned, in Austria we have, have a very strong right-wing, Salvini in Italy and so on and so on. So what do you think about this? You know, uh, is there a possibility in the future that you know something happens again, you know, uh, especially in in this context when we are talking about, uh, about uh, that we are aware that the far right movements and this racism is rising and is on the rise all around the Europe. Very, very important observations, uh, Ayub. Um, let me start by saying that um, genocide studies as, as a discipline, interdisciplinary area, if you like, uh, the, the, the main purpose of genocide studies is analyzing, identifying uh, kind of the patterns in, geno in different genocides with the aim to prevent future genocides or, do that, or those that might be in progress. So it's not a kind of a, a, a researching history and getting the facts sorted out, but really looking for these patterns. And the 10 stages of genocide developed by, by Professor Gregory Stanton, a very good framework for understanding to, to you know, really looking at but how does dehumanizing look like on the ground? How classification, symbolization and so on uh, happen? And looking at different uh, uh, case scenarios, different genocide, either Rwanda or Bosnia or the Holocaust, we can see some common patterns. Um, Unfortunately, uh, uh, Bosnian Muslims became the, the uh, well, will be, will go into history as people uh, who survived, who, who were, you know, subject to genocide in Europe at the end of the 20th century. However, um, 
this was the, in the context of, of that time and, and geography, if you like, and polit politics at the time. But uh, any, any religious or ethnic group, any minority can become a, a subject to genocidal violence and to genocide. Uh, if we remain within Europe, we will know, and everyone must know that, you know, in the 40s and even starting in the late 30s, a Holocaust was, uh, you know, perpetrated again, again uh, 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 European Jews and, um, you know, taking over millions of lives. Holocaust studies has helped, uh, uh, helped us identify other genocide and kind of the danger of, uh, if, of racist politics and so on. Um, in, in, in Bosnia, in the Bosnian genocide and the clim climate of Islamophobia, uh, it is not that only, well, people who are cosmopolitan, have cosmopolitan orientation and who want to learn from, from history or other people suffering that they learn. They are also perpetrators and those planning genocide and, and, and violence who learn from a bad example of the evil acts in the past. Mm. And uh, in Bosnia, for example, there were concentration camps that very much looked like on the concentration cam camps during the Second World War, those that you know had Jews interned and, and killed. Also, uh, mass graves, the ways, the strategy to kill civilians, you know, to execute, they were very much as if they were, you know, learned from a textbook about how to, you know, commit genocide. Or Holocaust, even some perpetrators such as uh, the very the notorious Adolf, whose real name was uh, uh, Goran Jelicic, in, in, uh, in, who, who uh, killed people in, in the town of Birchko in a concentration camp Luka, and he insisted on being called Adolf. It was not for any other Adolf than Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. So what we have seen after Srebrenica in this climate of Islamophobia, and there were different uh, moments that added to, to Islamophobia. But uh, 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 Srebrenica genocide or the perpetrators who committed Srebrenica genocide have uh, become role models to uh, uh, white supremacist terrorists. And mm -hmm. it's not just uh, on, on uh, social media where they spread the hate speech, where they you know, uh, uh, enjoy listening to, to uh, 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 some uh, songs such as, you know, Remove Kebab, you know, uh, very kind of bizarre uh, performance of, of uh, Serb soldiers during the war singing something that is uh, racist, but, you know, not even specially racist, just a stupid song. It's become a kind of an anthem of, of the uh, far right. And, you know, they entertain themselves by, you know, uh, mocking Muslims and, you know, calling for killing of Muslims, called, being called Turks. Then we have a, a, a terrorist uh, who wrote a, a manifesto, Brevik, where he makes references to, to what happened in former Yugoslavia, where he celebrates the perpetrators like Mladic. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, several years later, actually only last year, we had a New Zealand massacre, something like that never happened in, in New Zealand and also never happened in, in, uh, up there in Norway. But you have in a very peaceful society, just a cosmopolitan society, you have individuals who uh, are self-designed uh, 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 crusaders, if you like, who develop manifestos as their you know, ideological platform. And then they use Bosnian genocide as an example of how uh, uh, violence should be uh, committed, how their acts should be committed. So the evil doesn't, doesn't sleep. It might be dormant, but uh, uh, from... Uh, horrific episodes in, in, in our history, our recent history, our modern history, or even our distant history. Uh, also the, the future or the uh, contemporary uh, uh, perpetrators of evil learn and they use them as, as examples and actually as inspiration for their uh, evil deeds. So that's Professor why- Professor Harris, yes. maybe, maybe if, we, if we, we have only about 10 minutes left, so, um, I think the, the question that uh, um, Ayub was referring to on a, on a, on a more focused uh, in a more focused manner is about opportunities for prevention. When we look into, for example, the research and documentation center in Sarajevo that has been documented all this, what has been basis afterwards for the uh, hard tribunal uh, that could be used. Uh, if we look, how could we get, for example, the 
genocide, um, oblivion. It is not always a denial. Partly it's just a try of oblivion. It's just, I just wanted to be forgotten. Um, how could we get it into educational um, curriculums? How could we uh, ensure that the strategy uh, of many of the Muslim minority um, situations that we are in now within Europe uh, could deal best with this with this challenge. What could they do to prevent? Is it assimilation within to, uh, within to the European uh, societies that is a better strategy, or is it uh, the creation of a Muslim self consciousness as a strong um, uh, position within the societies that is that is more um, um, that is that is more to be uh, successful. When we look into this right-wing extremism that we can see all over Europe, when we see how hate speech has uh, yani, developed, that it has even reached countries like Sweden, Denmark, or, or Finland, where it was never uh, expected, uh, just to forget about Hungary and Poland and Serbia and what has been mentioned by, by others before. What do you think is the appropriate strategy for prevention? Uh, I don't, as a migration scholar, I don't think that assimilation of minorities is a way to go, kind of to become invisible. Even though the dream of, of um, most migrants probably uh, would be to become invisible. Well, uh, if a good example, or you know, bad example of how this didn't work, uh, you know, uh, German Jews, those that I just mentioned, the Holocaust, it didn't prevent, you know, it didn't save them from the Holocaust as much as they were mainstream and very integrated. In, in uh, the time that we live in, it would be also kind of, uh, also, you know, you know retreat uh, of our, for our cosmopolitan uh, ideals to somehow assimilate. What's the mainstream? How do we define the mainstream? Uh, multicultural societies like Australia or Canada might be uh, probably examples of, of how where this is successfully or to some degree successfully managed, managed better than in others. So the po official policy in Australia is policy of multiculturalism, which does not mean uh, creating a melting pot. However, it does mean that everyone uh, has this, the same um, rights as an individual and also in, you know, uh, to be part of shared humanity, to be, be part of that humanity might be called a nation or might be called a na uh, neighborhood, it doesn't matter. So um, insisting on, on, uh, on the same rights, but also at the same time, uh, gain, uh, providing, creating context in which other people can enjoy their human rights and dignity is, is a crucial step. So retreating in some ghettoized mentality or, or, or uh, disappearing, blending in, I don't think it, it, it's the, the right approach. Um, what we do right here now, talking about uh, uh, what happened 20 years ago and how this is affecting not only a, a, a religious minority, if you like, in Europe, even though I would never accept that uh, 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 my people in Bosnia are minority of any sort. Uh, and uh, European heritage is also not only Christian, but is, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Part of part of European his, traditions also inherited is Islam and, and Judaism as much as as uh, Enlightenment and you know Aufklärung which we just said in German previously and many other ideas Industrial Revolution and so on it's not polarizing somehow and you belong and you don't belong so what makes Europe very beautiful and special is that diversity that diversity also involves. Uh, 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 different uh, uh, languages and cultures and so on. And I don't think that the world, as, as a, a Bosnian uh, poet, uh, Abdullah Sidran said, would be any way more beautiful and better if somehow European Muslims, Bosnian Muslims perished in the 1990s. It would be uh, poorer as it has been poorer for all those communities that's perished in the Holocaust and in other uh, parts of, of European history. So talking as we are doing here, across borders, across continents, across cultures, languages is, is a way to go. And in a few days, we will also have a conference uh, in Sarajevo where uh, several uh, uh, scholars and, and activists from across the, 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 the globe and also from across different uh, religious, uh, ethnic, national affiliation will participate 
as one. And this is, this is the strength of our shared humanity. No, I, I would like now to, I don't, uh, 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 I really think that, okay, we now spoke about the Euro, but I, maybe we, we are uh, running out of time for this conversation, then we can go to the question and answer series if we have some questions for, for people, from the people who are watching us. Uh, but uh, I have one very important question, which is always on my mind because I was traveling a lot of through Bosnia and also because the Srebrenica Memorial Day, Day is uh, in, next week on the 11th of July. So my question is to ha Haris, to you uh, regarding the people who came back to Bosnia, uh, to, sorry, to the, to the Republika Srpska uh, to live uh, on their, in their houses, on their land after the 90s. Uh, what is with these? What is with these people, and what is the situation about about the returners, those who return to their homes, and how they are um, uh, exposed to uh, most, let's say, uh, vicious uh, 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 politics of, let's say, uh, uh, violation of human rights and and mistreatment by the Republika Srpska government, and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, I also uh, had uh, very recently a talk with uh, uh, one uh, friend of mine and she uh, said to me, uh, she, when she visited, for example, Srebrenica, the most striking thing for her was that, you know, when she realized and when she heard from the, one of the, uh, of the people who is living there, Muslim man, who is living in the, in the Srebrenica today, is that he knows exactly who killed his family and everyone, and uh, and uh, and uh, he is still uh, uh, free. He's living next uh, house uh, almost uh, to his. And there is a beautiful poem that I got from a friend of mine, Hamza Rijal from Bosnia, from Sarajevo, a few days ago. It is called Revenge. Uh, it is uh, from a, a, a very a short poem, uh, and uh, it is a very touching one. It is about uh, the guy, a person who lost his whole family, and he knows exactly who is a paper, paper who killed them, and he is now the owner of the bakery in the in his city, and his revenge is, I'm not going to this bakery. So this is so so was uh, uh, striking to me this this and and so uh, this question of or even the revenge you see and uh, so can you please share us for the end of this uh, let's say conversation uh, 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 the the current status of Bosnian Muslims who are still from my point of view are really the real uh, mujahids or let's say the real uh, one who are uh, uh, battling the the huge battle you know in in republika srpska to 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 again start their lives in on the territory from which they were expelled and their families were absolutely uh, 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 destroyed and 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 all uh, and killed i'll pick up on the, on the revenge thing uh, you yeah so there was not one single act of revenge where a uh, genocide survivor went to uh, take revenge against either a perpetrator or, or more broadly, randomly picking up uh, someone uh, you know, uh, to take that revenge. So there has, that hasn't been part of post-genocide culture in Bosnia, but has been part of post-genocide culture are so-called minority returns, returns of uh, survivors to the communities, to the geographic areas where they once made majority, but are now turned into minority. Uh, genocide did, did not happen just uh, as a kind of act of, of rage, where people just uh, decided to kill thousands and thousands of individuals. It was, the purpose of genocide was to get rid of the unwanted group, if you like, to create, there was a political, it's a political crime, and, but the aim of which was to create ethnically clean, in quotation marks, territories, or what Nazis called Lebensraum, the space, living space for one's own uh, national or ethnic group. And that's what General Mladic and, and the Serb militias, but that was the ultimate objective of genocide. Having created those uh, uh, clean territories, clean of, of, of uh, Muslims and Croats in, in some areas, um, there was a, in a way, 
uh, hard way, hard, there was a reluctance to accept that the, that objective was not completely fulfilled because they were somehow some returnees. In many cases, uh, women, because men were killed. So in many cases, mothers who lost their sons, uh, war widows who lost their husbands, were the pioneers on returning, reclaiming their land. And uh, that resilience and that, that uh, dignified resilience, if, lo if you like what my colleague uh, uh, Riada calls, has been also part of post-genocide uh, 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 culture and reality of Bosnia. Women returning to burn down homes, rebuilding these homes, and uh, survivors reclaiming what, what's left there. Uh, all this is happening in the context of something that was legalized, and thus something is Republika Srpska, where the same symbols and the same individuals still are there, and the laws that are created to, to, for Serbs to, to you know, even in the name of Republika Srpska, the entity uh, already indicate that no one else, uh, no other ethnicity belongs to that area. So people have been coping with that. And it is not just symbolic uh, uh, violence. It is also very often discrimination, active discrimination. But in spite of all, all of this, uh, 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 thousands and thousands of survivors have returned to their pre-war places, to their villages, and rebuilt some sense of community. In many instances, these are more individuals than, than original communities, but they give that feeling, yeah, we are back and we are not going to leave it. So there has been active discrimination, continues to be. Nonetheless, it hasn't deterred uh, very committed returnees to go back to their places. And sometimes they say, yeah, I'll go back and I will spend my last years and die you know, on, on, on the land that belongs to me. In other instances, they, they do build uh, prosperous kind of futures for their uh, uh, younger family members and they need to be acknowledged and, and celebrated. Um. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, yes, to... yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Professor Harris, uh, for, for being with us this morning. Um, I uh, believe that um, it was really uh, a very, very interesting and enriching uh, session that we had and where we had a deeper look into what is happening um, into the Balkan uh, today and uh, where we had yeah, a lot of lessons learned from the uh, difficult uh, experience that the Muslim community uh, in, in Bosnia has made. Uh, and uh, I believe for, for, for all of us activists and uh, academics within the various European uh, Western as well as Eastern countries, um, it, is, it is really important to have a deeper look into uh, the current situation and try to see uh, what we could do to prevent uh, these um, challenges that, uh, that we are seeing in a number of other countries. Um, the European Muslim Network has uh, ha targeted uh, uh, to reopen uh, a lot of discussions and, 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 um, and uh, forums uh, to um, enable the Muslim uh, activists and the Muslim community um, to look into the, the, the current challenges that we are facing in the various uh, countries. As you know, the European Muslim Network um, is heading uh, to support the creation of a, of a European Muslim identity that has to benefit uh, from the Eastern and the Western European experiences. And uh, as just described by you, Professor uh, uh, Harris, it is, it is clear that Islam has a third heritage to uh, European culture and uh, uh, the European uh, nations, if we, if we put it like this. Uh, is, is often forgotten, uh, and Bosnia, in the end, is one of the uh, important uh, milestones uh, that we have to refer to when we um, come to discuss how we can um, uh, yani develop this in the best way possible. So um, our target to um, have uh, Muslims uh, actively participating in their uh, different respective communities 
um, uh, needs to, to be aware of, of the genocide that took place and needs to put this also into the current Western um, uh, discussions. It is very, very important that this is not something that has only a relevance for the Muslim community. But if we come to speak about multicultural societies, if we come to speak about future uh, uh, models of living together um, in, in today's times, then it is really very, very important to understand uh, what happened in Bosnia, what lessons needs to be learned uh, as we have described it. Nobody was expecting this to happen again, but we, we see it happening. And so we need to, uh, we need to uh, learn how to, uh, to, to overcome this um, in, the, in, the, in the short future. Um, Ayub, I don't know whether you want to say something, um, Yanni, before we come to an end. Um, I just really would like to also, in my name and also in the name of EMN, uh, European Muslim Network, uh, and all the members of European Muslim Network, uh, to, to give my thanks to Professor Khalilovic. Really, thank you, Professor, because you dedicate your time. Uh, I repeat again once uh, uh, that you, uh, for everyone who can, you can go to, to the Academia Edu uh, uh, and uh, to check the Professor Khalilovic uh, profile, you, re you will find really, really uh, very important work on Bosnia and genocide and such, and it is free to download. Uh, so. Yeah, and thanks again to, 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 to Professor Khalilovic and uh, all the best from my side to him in his uh, future work and everything. Yeah, uh, thank from... you Ayub and thank you Ibrahim. And uh, I really, uh, it's been a, a great pleasure and an honor for me to speak to Europe, European uh, Muslim Network. Uh, you are doing great work and even with, with your name, which some might uh, think it's somehow strange, European Muslim, nothing strange about it. So I wish you good luck. Please, uh, you know, continue with your important activities, you know, spreading the word of tolerance and then uh, making yourself, you know, heard and seen uh, in all your, you know, wisdom and dignity that you've got and that you share with your uh, communities that you live in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I will use the opportunity to um, invite you all to the next event that we have planned to have on the 26th of July, uh, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, European time. Uh, we will have Dr. Amina Isdas from the Montfort University uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Leicester. Uh, and she will speak about uh, count, uh, countering Islamophobia in Europe. So it is a, a very connected, um, a very connected theme. And I hope that uh, all of you will have the opportunity to join. Whoever wants to know more about the European Muslim Network could also visit our website, eumuslim.net or uh, Facebook or the YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Barakallahu feekum. And um, all the best. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Salam. All the best.